Hello, and welcome to the MIT Open Documentary Lab Talks. I'm Sarah Wallison, the director of the lab, and it's my pleasure to introduce Michael Zeitkow, who's the founder and executive director of Potions and Pixels. Uh, it's a nonprofit organization in Charlotte, North Carolina, that utilizes games, art, and technology, and they work with city governments and local community organizations to create social impact. He's created a lot of projects from No CLT, an app that allows people to explore the history of uh, Brooklyn, a Charlotte neighborhood, once the largest black community in the Carolinas, um, to games that engage people with city politics. We can learn more about Michael um, uh, in his bio, which we'll put on the chat and also on our website. Um, and now he's going to talk to us about his work. Um, before I hand it over to him, just a reminder to put your questions in the Q&A and we'll do our best to call on you and answer them. And the talk will be about 45 minutes and then we have 45 minutes for questions and comments. Um, so without further ado, Michael Zeitkapp. Hey, everybody. Thanks so much for having me. I'm super excited to be with you all. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah? Okay, great. I just wanted to make sure I was good here. Um, yes, thank you, Sarah. Appreciate that introduction. Uh, my, my last name is certainly one that's difficult to pronounce. I used to actually be a, a high school teacher and I just went by Mr. Z. It made it a lot easier for the students rather than attempting to butcher my name. But I got my information right here. Um, just so if anybody wants to reach out or learn more about our organization, Potions and Pixels, you have my email there as well. Um, yeah, I'm going to jump into it. So um, our organization, as Sarah said, is focused on utilizing games, art and technology to uh, create a social impact. Um, a little bit of a background about myself first. My love of games has been since I've been a child. My earliest memories are the Commodore 64 and um, the um, the uh, Nintendo Entertainment System. These are probably familiar to a lot of people here, but po Pole Position was a personal favorite of mine growing up. Uh, I, I recently dug up this photo of myself on a, on a, I think a very happy Christmas where I got two uh, classic games right there. So literally this has kind of been in, in my DNA from the get-go. My, my father was a computer scientist. He always um, introduced us to a lot of uh, really amazing technology. And I was super excited uh, with games from the start and so um uh let me jump over here to this next one uh, games yeah games have been something that have been part of my life when i was 11 years old i used to be a game journalist believe it or not at a young age i was writing game reviews uh, about probably much more mature violent games than i should have actually been playing uh but uh you know uh, I, I was a, a child of immigrant parents who didn't know about the rating system whatsoever. And so they had no idea what a mature or a rated, uh, you know, a rated M game was about at the time. Um, as I got older, I continued playing more competitive games. I actually got uh, really good at the Pokemon card game. I know the Pokemon game is, um, the card game has gotten quite a bit of a resurgence now among collectors. But when I was 14 years old, I was actually the seventh highest ranked player in the United States. And so I was sent to Hawaii, um, which at the time, actually, when we got a voicemail from Wizards of the Coast, I completely thought this was a prank. Uh, but I was incredibly excited. My mom was incredibly excited. We got to go to a trip to Honolulu and, um, and play with the best Pokemon players across the entire world, which was really amazing. And I actually got a, a gold medal here and I had to beat the Japanese uh, national champion, which was a 12 year old girl, which it was an incredibly, um, wow, an incredibly challenging match. She was very, uh, very serious the entire time that we played until the, the match was actually over and then it was completely smiles. And I actually didn't realize she was the Japanese national champion until the end of the match when Japanese television cameras surrounded me. Uh, if you can spot me right here, this is, this is me actually um, right here, but an incredibly amazing experience in my life to get to play with people all across the world and, uh, you know, and, and play with the creator of the game uh, and play with so many amazing people. Uh, so as I've said, yeah, games have truly been a part of my life 
um, as far back as I can remember. Um, but after actually high school, I kind of focused more on the activism side of thing. I just grabbed a few kind of photos of some of the some work and projects I've been in, involved in. Um, most of my works uh, doing community organizing has been on the environmental front, but I've also worked on police reform issues, a, a wide variety of things. And uh, also, um, as Sarah mentioned, was heavily involved, still am heavily involved in, in local politics. I actually ran for city council and uh, to this day, I'm still the only person in the history of our city to ever get on the ballot as an unaffiliated um, independent candidate. So something I'm proud of being able to raise awareness of a lot of issues that I felt uh, had had gone neglected for far too long. Um, I also worked on a variety, variety of different projects. I figured I'd show this one since it relates somewhat to uh, placemaking. Most of the placemaking projects we're working on now are more in the digital placemaking side of things, but um, we've done a lot of different uh, projects in the past. And this one was working with a uh, neighborhood organization to make walkability easier in the community. Um, and as I mentioned with all of my activism, um, I, I could never fully get away from my core gaming roots. So anytime I had a chance, even when we're doing kind of activist political theater, I would incorporate some kind of gaming element to it. So uh, great way to bring in um, Monopoly here while challenging corporations. Um, and oh, uh, yeah, I figured I'd show this one. I actually just dug this up today. I figured this would be interesting to show. One of the kind of the last projects I did before leaving to, uh, to pursue Potions and Pixels full time was helping pass um, uh, what was called, called the Strategic Energy Action Plan here in Charlotte. Um, and, so, and part of that, um, since we passed it unanimously as a city, um, we were awarded to be a Bloomberg American Cities Climate Challenge winner. And I got a chance to take this picture with the mayor and uh, the mayor of Charlotte that is here and Michael Bloomberg. And if, and if you can spot it, I don't know if you can see it from here. So I actually got a second picture, but the sweater I'm wearing is also a Pokemon sweater. So I figured I'd throw that in here too, just to show how serious I am about bringing in gaming into all aspects of my life. But as I mentioned, Potions and Pixels is a nonprofit organization uh, that utilizes games to create social impact. We have been around since 2016, but I have been doing it uh, fully as a nonprofit since the beginning of 2020, which is an interesting time to start a brand new nonprofit. Interesting story about that. You'll, you'll find that I'm gonna go through quite a few tangents here as I, as I go through uh, the story of Potions and Pixels and the work we do. Um, I actually left my job at a sustainability organization in December of 2019, thinking that 2020 was gonna be the year that we were going to um, expand and especially on the social front. A lot of the things, as you guys can see, I like to tell our story through pictures. Um, we do a lot of social in-person interactions. And um, the very first day of 2020, I was on my way to a gaming convention in DC. I was super excited. Uh, this small indie game studio that I'm a part of, our game was selected to be uh, showcased. And on my way out of town, I stopped by our storage units because uh, we have multiple storage units worth of equipment to handle um, our big events, which typically have a few hundred people. And uh, when I got to my storage unit, unfortunately, I found out that it had completely been burglarized. And um, all of our TVs, with the exception of one, were stolen and so many other things. And uh, it was an incredibly sad moment to start 2020, to start doing this full time. Uh, as well, uh, since we do a lot of events and our equipment is such an important part of, of what we do in addition to the game development and things you'll see here soon. Um, but we still went to DC, still showcased the game. And I got a call two days later from the detective and um, I assumed he was gonna talk ab about th the case and, and you know the burglary that had happened only to find out that he told us that another one of our storage units got burglarized. So 2020 started off quite horribly and um, uh, and it uh, continued to get worse, as everybody knows. Um, I, it took us a couple months uh, to get our equipment kind of, um, to purchase more equipment, to be able to do more events, only to get all of our equipment ready the week before all the, the big shutdowns started happening. So uh, it's been an interesting year, and I'm happy to elaborate on the, the challenges of uh, starting and operating and expanding a, a nonprofit during this time. But fortunately, all, all has ended well and it continues to go well. 
Um, I like to show off these photos. These are pre-COVID photos, um, but it showcases, I think, to me, the power of games and bringing people together. We've hosted over 500 events, and these photos right here are actually groups of strangers that came together at our events and left as friends. Um, and I think that's incredibly telling of the power of games to bring people together. I feel like there's no other ac activity actually that can break the ice in, in such a, a unique way that allows people to really feel comfortable and have fun and kind of enter these um, kind of imaginary worlds of sorts and, and play with one another. Um, our whole motto is play, learn, create. We want people to play games. We love games, board games, video games, everything. But we also want in the process for people to learn and to also become creators themselves. Uh, so a lot of the programs you'll see that we offer in our community um, are focused on those components as well. Um, so we kind of do a mix. We want to bring people in to experience the, the, the social and amazing benefits games have to offer, but also create games, create experiences, learn about different um, um, technology that they can create in the community. But yeah, hopefully you guys check this out if you're ever in Charlotte and, uh, and have an opportunity. We're hosting events. Uh, would love to, to have you all there. This was our, our one most recent event when we had that brief moment of time where we were um, mask-free indoors. Of course, that, that's changed as well, but uh, this is kind of one of our few events that we've been able to host this year. Um, some of the other projects we do in our community are workforce development projects. Uh, this one you see here in particular was a project that uh, we created completely from scratch to address a need in our community, and that's um, a shortage of people in the electrical um, side of construction. And so we partnered with Habitat for Humanity, our local uh, government, the city of Charlotte, um, as well as DPR Construction and um, several other sponsors to create this program. And I can kind of go through some of these photos, make them a little larger here. The idea behind this program was to offer something for people who are unemployed, underemployed, or, or seeking a career change and offer it in a really fun and innovative way. And so the idea here was to teach these core fundamental electrical skills that are um, so, so needed in the electrical side of construction especially as the, uh, that side, uh, the demographics are aging. And so there's a huge shortage of labor, especially on, um, uh, from youthful employees. And so we trained, as you can see, most people are on the younger side. It, it did have a whole range of individuals. We, we certainly didn't limit who was able to participate in that way. Um, but the whole idea was to teach these fundamental skills through uh, working on our old arcade machines. And so we teamed up with a local barcade, um, shout out to Abari here in Charlotte, North Carolina, and worked with them in providing lessons for the students so that they could actually revive all of these machines. So as part of their kind of group projects, they had five machines that they were uh, to work on and bring back to life. And so as you can see here, um, we had students working on a variety of things, uh, including soldering uh, with televisions, um yeah we have a few of those photos right here this is from the inside of an arcade cabinet a lot of teamwork involved we had the the dpr construction uh who was offering jobs to the students um as well as several other employers were able to watch and um, participate not only in teaching some of the lessons but it was very invaluable to them because they could actually see the students over the course of three months and see how they worked uh, individually, how they worked in teams, um, and um, how they could potentially work on larger scale construction projects. And this is actually within a uh, one of the largest buildings in um, Uptown Charlotte. Uh, and this is one of the individuals from DPR Construction. And this individual right here that you see in the front is actually working on major construction projects right now, just a, a few miles away from where I'm sitting. So we have a lot of success stories um, from this and we're really excited with the results. Uh, unfortunately, we had to put a pause on this program in 2020, of course, due to COVID, but this is something that we will be expanding here um, uh, as soon as we're able to. We got a lot of great attention for this program and um, was really seen as an opportunity to, to help on the economic um, mobility, upward mobility side of things. Unfortunately, Charlotte um, was, was rated last um, um, among the, most, I think, the top 50 major cities in terms of 
um, economic mobility from a, a Harvard study. And that's something that has kind of reverberated throughout our city over the last few years. And is something that um, everybody's kind of looking for as far as solutions. So we were glad we were able to participate in some way to, um, to provide those opportunities in our community. We also offer a lot of different youth programs. I'll actually, I won't expand too much on this one right here because um, towards the end of the presentation, I can talk about um, some of the key youth programs that we have, especially related to augmented reality and um, game development. Um, we do do youth esports. Youth esports are growing at such an astronomical rate. And one of the kind of the core issues uh, is not necessarily access to the equipment. That is certainly um, an issue, but a larger issue is actually access to kind of organized play, scholarship opportunities, mentorship opportunities, coaching, things along those lines. So we were excited to be able to bring in um, some awesome local esports players and have them act as mentors to, to local students in the area. And this is something we'll be expanding as well. Uh, we also do, as I'll be kind of going into much more detail here in a minute, game development and community engagement. We work a lot with local government. The city of Charlotte is um, a regular client of ours. We work with them on a regular basis to uh, do a variety of things from developing games for the community to offering things like, uh, in this case, we brought together people from the community on the, the game development side to see ways that we can expand um, the game industry in Charlotte itself. Um, we work with neighborhoods. This, is, this has been a great way for me to kind of use my community organizing background as well and the relationships I've developed over the years and, and the trust in the community um, to be able to, to find innovative ways to engage and, and get input. One of the programs that we did during um, the kind of the peak, I would say, of our kind of home um, isolation during COVID was recess. The idea behind this program um, and I should mention, as you can see there, this is sponsored by Lowe's, um, which is in um, the Charlotte area, headquartered here in, in Mooresville. Um, the idea here was to be able to kind of combat the fact that we're all socially, because we're socially isolating, we want to combat the fact of, um, excuse me, because we're socially distancing, rightfully so, we want to combat so, social isolation. And so we kind of developed a, a three-month program where we created a uh, a series of interactive events, whether they be kind of webinars, kind of like this. Um, we would do them on Twitch, YouTube, and Facebook, and have a variety of panels, as you guys can see here. Uh, things like Games to the Rescue, where we brought three doctors to discuss how games are actually being used to fight coronavirus, or Black Voices in Gaming, um, a variety of different topics. We ended up doing 103 events over the course of three months, so we were really ambitious with this, and um, did a lot. And we also offered um, gaming tournaments, as you guys can see here with Smash Brothers and, and a whole series of things, online board game events. And so it was really an opportunity for us to make sure that we could connect with one another and stay connected with one another and continue to build community, even during times where um, we all have to uh, rightfully distance from one another. And so we're really proud of this um, uh, program and the participation level was really high. Um, really high. And we were uh, glad to see so many people. And, and, you know, the feedback, so much of the feedback came from people who, who honestly said that they, they felt um, they did feel isolated and having an opportunity to play with people, video games or board games online with one another or to participate in these conversations really meant a lot to them. So one of the games that I mentioned um, was uh, a, something that we did for the planning department. Um, and this is the Charlotte Future City Building game. Um, this was a game that um, the planning department here reached out to us about uh, because the city recently went through a multi-year process to develop a comprehensive plan um, for the city. Uh, we were one of the kind of largest cities that up until recently didn't have a major comprehensive plan, something that uh, was decades old and so needed to be updated. And so based on the work and, and reputation we had in the community, um, uh, the planning department came to us and asked if we can develop a game. I should say originally that 
they had, because this is a, a massive document, um, as, as big as you can imagine, uh, and multiple consultants are involved with creating it. Actually, there was initially some consultants involved with creating another game, um, but the city reached out to us because they wanted something that was a bit more fun and engaging, uh, a bit easier to understand, and that would um, really teach people the concepts of the comprehensive plan in a, in a really user-friendly way. Um, so I'm going to go over a few of the things here with the game. I should say that this game is available as a physical game and as a digital game. Um, the physical game, unfortunately, is all account, or I, I should say, fortunately, is all accounted for. The city printed um, several thousand copies, and um, within just a few days, all of them were claimed. So we were incredibly proud with the reception that we received in the city and the reaction from the community. Um, of having an innovative way to engage with the public and, and learn about the comprehensive plan. So everything you see here um, is directly from the plan itself down to the colors of the cards themselves. Uh, so it's a great way for uh, the community to learn about the plan without, uh, without you know, jumping into a, a biblical size text that could be daunting to anyone. And so here are some of the place types um, so a lot of these things could be recognizable to you wherever community you're in. This is kind of a um, a way to to take all of the different place types that we want to see as a community and narrow them down to ten different areas. We also have a variety of projects and programs that the city is pursuing. So we have those listed here, from transit to green infrastructure, and then 10 goals that the community through a long-term uh, engagement process um, landed on. Uh, so through a lot of public input and through um, uh, several years of work narrowed down into these 10 goals. And so what we did is we wanted to gamify this experience. Uh, as I said, there's, this is, it's quite daunting, the material itself. So how do you take this subject matter and encourage people to not only want to learn about it, but then to also make decisions, strategic decisions um, about the future of their city and really get a better understanding of what decision makers have to go through. And so this is something that I'm uh, particularly proud of. Oh, I should also say this was, uh, I'll, I'll do a quick tangent here, but I'm really proud of the fact that we were on billboards throughout the city. I never thought I'd be designing a game um, that was on billboards. So that was a, a personal moment of um, achievement that I thought was, was really great. I'll actually go back to, yeah, I'll go back to this for a moment here um, before I show off some of the, the digital components of this. Um, you know, a, a challenge with developing any sort of game is making sure it's engaging. And I truly believe that games are going to be, um, we're just seeing the beginning of games used by um, government and nonprofits and businesses, for that matter, as a means of engagement and as a means of helping people comprehend otherwise difficult topics. For me, a lot of the game development, I should say I developed this game, um, is about addressing the empathy gap. As somebody who works um, for the last 10 years, that we're having worked in local government, done community organizing, I can tell you, and I think we've all experienced this firsthand, how easy it is to kind of flippantly say, oh, government should be spending my money on this, or why aren't they doing this? Why aren't they doing that? And you know, the fact of the matter is every community that we're living in, we're dealing, and every government is dealing with the fact that we have an unlimited amount of wants and needs in the community, but a limited amount of resources. And so it's easy to potentially read about that or watch about that in the news. And those, that's all great ways to kind of absorb information. But I think what's unique about gaming is it offers an opportunity for players to actually be in the shoes of decision makers and have, have to make choices. Um, so when you're left with a choice of saying, hey, I can only build so many of these or I can only um, you know, address these goals so far, then the, the player who is developing their community uh, they don't have the luxury of saying, hey, we should do everything and we should, you know, snap of the finger, wave of the magic wand, we can take care of all the problems in the community. The whole goal with these games is to make people realize that there are challenges uh, to bettering our community. There are challenges to developing the city that we want to see um, Charlotte become in the future. And to be able to uh, simulate that in a way that's, that's fun, but also provides a learning experience. 
Um, and so I'll, I'll elaborate on that a bit more, but I should say that um, during the height of COVID, we worked with the city to host a series of online events. So we adapted the game to be able to be played digitally. So you can see right here what it looks like. Um, and in this case, each player has their, their board. I don't have enough time to necessarily go through the, the rules fully here, but just to give you an idea, the game involves people developing their own city, what they think um, Charlotte should look like by the year 2040. And that includes selecting the goals they want. So the idea here behind this game was to give a lot of freedom to the players. Um, I'm a firm believer that games should not uh, be preachy and they should not be edutainment. I think my generation grew up with games in, in the classroom where um, we were it was kind of a, a bit of uh, we shouldn't have even used the word games, I should say. Uh, a teacher would sometimes tack on the term games and it just meant that we would be, you know, rolling a dice and answering quiz questions, um, you know, moving around like a Monopoly board. And that's not fun. That's not fun for anyone, actually. So um, we want to create games that are first and foremost fun, uh, but then that really tackle these topics and do it in a way where people develop a deeper understanding. And so with a game like this, um, the players, it's up to the players to decide what goals they're going to set for their city. It's up to the players to decide what they're going to build, where they're going to build it. Uh, and since it is a planning game, I should say a huge part of it is the spatial component. So are you going to build affordable housing next to transit? Um, you know, are you going to build open space next to certain types of neighborhoods? It's up to you to decide. And you, since you have certain limitations in place, you realize how challenging it is to be able to um, effectively accomplish all the goals you want in your community. Uh, but again, I think games are very unique in that regard, because as after playing this, you develop that level of appreciation and say, hey, you know what, I didn't realize the challenges that um, uh, we're facing at the community at this level, or I didn't realize the challenges that decision makers are facing. Um, and hopefully it encourages people to be involved. And the other part I should say that was most encouraging is that after playing, there was a lot of people that didn't even realize they learned something. And that's the best actual achievement is that you're playing, you get sucked in, you want to score points, you get excited about the game, competing against other players. And then at the end of the game, it would be routine for players to say, oh, if only I had this, this card, I would have been able to achieve this specific goal. If only, you know, that sort of thing. And when you hear players say that, you're, you're realizing uh, that they are essentially through the course of playing, they're kind of learning about the plan itself. What are the ingredients in order to create a certain city that we want? Um, and so that's really exciting. And so um, in this game in particular, and I'll, and I'll move through this part um, fairly quickly here, is that, again, the goal is to create a city and to create certain um, and to select certain goals. So by the end of the game, a player's board looks something along these lines, for example. And again, a variety of goals that are uh, common for a lot of communities um, in the United States and, and, and abroad, uh, balanced mobility, housing diversity, 10 minute neighborhoods, healthy and active communities, these sorts of things. Um, and so I'm really proud of the fact that we we're able to take these heavier topics and distill them into a game that was short and, um, um, and, and, and effective. We also added a, a layer, I put in bonus cards uh, into the game to make the game um, interesting to play every single time. There's other unique design challenges, of course, with it being paid for by uh, grant money and city funds. I wanted to make sure the game was cost effective. So I had all the cards double sided as well to save some funds on that side for our community. Um, I'll move on to the next game that we created. Um, all of this, I should say, I'm really proud of the fact of, that we've done all of these programs outside of the workforce development um, within this last year. So it's been a whirlwind of a year. We actually developed this game. I, um, I'll go back to this for a moment. I developed this within one month's time, believe it or not. This was uh, a month that I will never forget in my life. Uh, there was a very short turnaround time. And, and that, that is from game design to um, graphics to everything. It was um, remarkably short. I don't think I'll ever do that again, but um, it was memorable to say the least. Uh, now, Trash Dash CLT was also a short amount of time. We developed this mobile video game within um, three months, actually. And this is available for free if any of you are interested in playing it. Um, whatever community you're in, it's actually available uh, internationally on all the on Android and iOS and the App Store and the Play Store. 
And the idea behind this game, this is something that we worked with our solid waste services department to develop a game. This one's a bit more arcade like. Um, I'll play this video here for, for you all to, to see the gameplay. Oops. So with this game, as you can see, it's a bit of a, a different approach. Um, part of this was also to develop a game that could be played in short bursts um, by individual players. Um, so again, uh, some of these game design decisions were made with COVID in mind, um, but also just uh, for convenience. And so with this game you see here, uh, we have the city. So we modeled some of our most iconic buildings um, Uptown Charlotte. I know most people refer to their their communities um, as downtown in Charlotte. We're known for referring to our community uh, or our center city as Uptown. And so we modeled those 3D areas. And we also actually have these five areas that you see here are actually correspond to the five days of the week that the trash is picked up. So we obviously simplified the geometry a bit, made it circular a little bit easier to read. Uh, and again, th in this case, the game is has more of an arcade feel that you can kind of play within three minutes or so um but it's a highly addicting game that people really are excited about and appreciate and i think um what's really exciting about this is it actually really does a good job of explaining to people kind of the basic fundamental actions that solid waste services takes um you know part of this was developing it developing a game for people to get a better appreciation for the work they do uh, a lot of people take solid waste services for granted um you know, your, your, your trash gets picked up and you don't really think much about it. But the idea here is that you realize how much maintenance goes into these trucks, how much time they have to spend at landfill dumping. I had no idea until I, I started this project and toured and did, you know, kind of a ride along of sorts with them, how much time they spent dumping um, trash in, at the landfill and waiting there. And so as you play the game, you also see, um, that the community is rapidly growing. Charlotte is one of the fastest growing cities in the United States. And so that's simulated in the game as well. So you see the buildings rise, you see trash being increasingly produced and it becomes one of those difficult scenarios. We intentionally made the game difficult for people to appreciate that fact um, that it is a, an ever increasingly difficult job and the solid waste services department has a limited amount of resources. Uh, we also wanted to make sure the game had a lot of longevity. And so we created this entire perk system. And so you can, do you want larger trucks? Do you want faster trucks? Do you want to expand your recycling program? Uh, you can customize however uh, you would like to see your operation. And so the basic goal of the game, as you probably saw through the video, is you want to be able to get as high of a score as possible. Um, and in order to do so, you have to pick up trash on time and keep uh, Charlotteans happy. And by keeping them happy, you can kind of expand your operation. Uh, but if you fail to pick up trash um, on time and you do that consistently, then you'll, you'll lose the game. Um, and so we also added this social kind of leaderboard where players could share their scores online and compare one another, how much trash bags they had collected as their peak score, as well as how much total trash they collected. Uh, we also um, got a lot of great feedback about the mascot we created, uh, Ronnie, the raccoon. Um, uh, raccoons are obviously um, usually quite heavily associated with trash, but we thought we'd flip the script a bit and uh, reclaim um, the kind of the cute factor there. It was also great. What's awesome about working with government on these projects is when our games are released, it also can kind of come out with a big splash. So uh, the game's release coincided with the mayor proclaiming uh, the day as Sanit Sanitation Engineer Appreciation Day. Also, um, if you're familiar with our um, uptown um, our buildings, our skyline, you'll know that we have a very colorful skyline that's known for lighting up in a variety of different colors. And so it was lit up um, in colors in appreciation for um, the Solid Waste Services Department and the release of this game. 
also got a lot of great feedback and a great attention in the community uh, by a lot of outlets. And this is something I'm incredibly uh, um, happy and appreciative of about here um, is that, you know, we're sitting at a perfect five-star rating in this game and that so much of the feedback is about people not realizing how much work the solid waste service department does. And that's something that I appreciate so much um, because that means, you know, mission accomplished that we um, created a game that allowed people to learn um, not only how the solid waste services department um, works, but, you know, again, gain some empathy and understanding for them. Uh, this is my daughter here. I, I had to throw this in. She saw how much time I was working on this. And so she created these perler bead. Uh, these are the garbage cans and, and garbage bags. And so I, I had to give her a shout out here. And um, yeah, she's holding it on, on phone and iPad. It's fun to be able to compete against my kids and so many others. It's also fun to actually, I've run into people in our community who like pull me aside and ask me to tell them what the secret cheat codes are, the perks or anything like that. What is the, what is the best combination? Um, but I got to say, actually, there's people in our community that are, um, have higher scores than our whole development team. Um, and I want to give a shout out to our whole development team because um, there are several people involved in these projects. We just, we have, you know, a genius programmer, a genius artist, genius sound designer, and I'm and super appreciative of them and, and the hard work they do to make these projects come to, to fruition. Uh, the next project I want to talk about and kind of move over to um, the augmented reality side of the conversation here is an app that was just released, um, actually, um, just two months ago. Um, it's two months ago to the day, actually. I think we had one of our launch parties there. Um, and so this is something we teamed up with, with the Levine Museum of the New South um, and developed an app known as NoCLT. Uh, in the first experience, this is an ever-evolving app. We're actually planning, um, it's been really successful and we're already working with the museum to plan the next experience for the app. It's gonna grow with all sorts of different historical experiences that people can use, utilize the app to, um, to learn about. Um, but the first part was about the historic Brooklyn neighborhood in Charlotte. Now, if you're not familiar with that neighborhood, it's, it's something that actually up until recently, a lot of Charlotteans weren't familiar with. Um, our uptown area is divided into four wards. So if you're ever in, in, in Charlotte uptown, the second ward at one point was the largest uh, black neighborhood in the Carolinas, uh, the center of black cultural and um, economic life. And um, unfortunately it was completely decimated through a process called urban renewal. And so the neighborhood lasted from the late 1800s to the 1960s and um, with the exception of a few buildings on one block uh, is completely been erased. And so this app was an effort to tell the stories of the people and um, in, the, in the community of Brooklyn. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, the Levine Museum of the New South, um, so we partnered with them in this, they were absolutely amazing to work with and their research is um, incredible, great partners to work with on an app like this. I do want to share um, this video. It's I, I just want to share about four minutes of this video because I honestly feel that it's much better uh, for you all to hear directly from residents and people who had experience in Brooklyn before I start talking about how we adapted this and turned it into an augmented reality app. Change is no good if it's not for the better. Some change ain't no good at all. This is where we orchestrated in this community. And this was known as Brooklyn. This is where black folk lived. Yeah. This is where the churches were. Yeah. This is where our businesses were. Yeah. The neighborhood of Brooklyn, for then it was ideal because Everybody looked out for everybody's children. Didn't nobody have nothing. But it was close. You could sleep on the front porch. You could walk. Get up and go anywhere you want to go at any time of night. Didn't have no problems. Charlotte's Brooklyn neighborhood existed for about the first two-thirds of the 20th century. 
Uh, it's the area that today is the government center, uh, Marshall Park, uh, NASCAR Hall of Fame, all of, all of that in the center city. Um, it was most of the second ward neighborhood as segregation hardened became the most important African-American neighborhood. Uh, Brooklyn was the center of civic life. It was where the Black Main Street was, roughly where today's Martin Luther King Boulevard was. It was a beloved neighborhood. We played hopscotch in the street and play ball in the street, kickball and softball. All that was played right out, right over there. And, and when I close my eyes, I can see all of that. We had dry cleaners. We had grocery stores. We had meat markets. We had shoe shine stands, barber shops. Brooklyn is a wonderful place to live. We used to make pallets on the front porch and they'll never forget. You had poor people, you had middle class people, and maybe even a little more affluent people. Congested streets, inadequate parking, retail vacancies. There's only one answer. That is a master plan of development. It's do or die for downtown Charlotte right now. During a period of time, there was this urban renewal that came through, and I often heard it growing up as a child as being referred to as black removal, because that's what I witnessed, that black folk were actually displaced from the Brooklyn community, which was uptown Charlotte, and moved to the west side. When they could say they're going to tear down Brooklyn, and they start putting up posters letting you know. Then the next thing you know, we're shitting down everything. Time to go. was with if you wipe out blighted neighborhoods you'll you'll have the perfect city and unfortunately they did divide they defined blighted neighborhoods as neighborhoods where there were a lot of absentee landlords a lot of rundown housing which often was african-american neighborhoods because of redlining and other things that kept african-americans from easily buying homes the property was significant uh, people felt that brooklyn was uh, a shanty town at all uh, shotgun housing, blighted. Well, there was a part of Brooklyn that certainly had low-income housing or, or housing that wasn't very affordable. But guess what? It also had houses that had multi-bedrooms, multi brought iron fences, really two-story homes. They were owned by African-Americans. So there was a variety of price point housing in Brooklyn. Okay. I feel like a stranger in my hometown. There's so much change. Because I can't even find my way now when I come down here. Let's see. On this side of the street, the Savoy would have been right about right in there, the Savoy Theater. I don't see anything here that remotely helps me to remember where anything is. None of this is. Uh, if that was where Second Street, we would have made a left there and about right in there, the Savoy Theater. And where all those gray buildings are would have been buildings, apartments. And on down there would have been black businesses, cafes, tailor shops, uh, hairdressers. In the last few years, which will come to fruition, So I, I wanted to play that video because I thought, again, it was important for you all to hear directly from um, community members and, and residents um, uh, of, the, of the Brooklyn community um, and to also kind of get a better understanding of the context. Um, it's something that, again, is becoming, thankfully, more people are, are aware of in, in Charlotte. And, and for that matter, there's the story of Brooklyn is is something unfortunately that is um, 
common across the entire United States. So there's a, a Brooklyn of sorts in every major American city, the story of um, people of color being displaced and, and moved um, for a variety of reasons. And so we really wanted to honor the story in a, in a very special way with this app. Uh, and so through No CLT, again, uh, the first experience that the Levine Museum of the New South wanted to focus on was Historic Brooklyn. And so this is a picture of the app. Again, this app is com completely free as well. You can download it right now. Uh, if you are not in Charlotte, the only major difference is that you will kind of experience the remote version of the app. Um, the app itself was initially designed, as you can see here with the map, to be a, um, a tour, a physical tour. So you can walk around or bike around to these different sites and experience all of the different content. And the different content is, is a wide variety. It's images, it's poetry, it's interviews, it's video. Um, it's everything you can imagine. A lot of historical archived material to, to help people better understand um, what Brooklyn um, was. Uh, and so as you walk around, you can listen to audio. We have an achievement system as well, which I will get to here in, in a moment. Um, but it really allows people to experience um, kind of a, a museum-like um, experience, but in the actual community where the history itself was made. And there's no route, specific route you have to take. You can enter at any point. You can exit at any point. Um, you can um, make the experience what you will. Um, and once you visit certain sites, and I'll go to the augmented reality portion here in a moment, but you can see that there's all sorts of different types of content and you can um, read about it, listen to it. You can also, we have a comment and share system so people could leave feedback about specific items. You can share the content online. So we really wanted to make that component really social. Uh, and of course the, the part the kind of cherry on top of the experience is the um, augmented reality piece. And so this is something our team is in particular very proud of because I think we've done some really innovative things. Uh, of course, I think uh, for those unfamiliar, augmented reality is essentially overlaying digital content onto the real world. Um, and you, Pokemon Go is usually kind of the most famous example to use kind of in a mainstream fashion. But in this case, what we designed was um, utilizing augmented reality to bring the neighborhood to life. And so unfortunately, this video seems to come off pretty choppy. We tested it before this call. So I assure you, if you get a chance to experience it uh, in real life, it's it's butter smooth, but I'll, I'll still play this just so you can kind of get a understanding of what the experience looks like. And AME Zion church leaders moved their publishing operation to Charlotte in 1894. For decades, the AME Zion Publishing House operated out of the James Varick Building, named for the first bishop of the AME Zion Church. It became the intellectual center for black political and spiritual life in the South, publishing the Star of Zion, one of the most important black newspapers in the country. And so hopefully that gives you a taste of what it, um, of what it looked like. And I can kind of show you here a bit more so you can kind of understand um, what the experience is. But that's something we're incredibly proud of. If you noticed in the video, um, the user just points and clicks. They don't have to scan a code or do something else uh, that is uh, like a QR code or things like that. That's normally associated with AR experiences. The only QR codes that we have as part of this experience is if people want to scan it to download the app initially. But after that, they point it at these sites and the AR experience uh, will, um, as you saw, the screen will fade into black and white and the um, photo fitted historic image uh, will fade in along with audio. So in this case, a user just has to stand at the historic site. They aim, oops, sorry, went the wrong order here. And then this is what they'll see. And uh, if you notice, we're very proud of the effect of how well these images line up with their surroundings. As you can see, that's the sidewalk as it, was, as it currently is. And this is the sidewalk in the image. So this is something um, we spent a great deal of time just perfecting. Uh, this whole project took about three months, which is also um, incredibly fast, all things considered. Um, it's actually lightning speed 
uh, considering the fact that um, we actually built two applications. We built one for the public, but we also built one for the museum so that they can upload content on the fly that would um, automatically update into the app. So if the um, museum finds new photo or audio, they could upload it while we're having this conversation right now, and it'll um, go into the app. Uh, it'll be live in the app. So, so for that, you know, for, for to be able to do this, you're essentially utilizing every piece of technology your phone has to offer. You're utilizing your gyroscopes, your accelerometer, your GPS, your camera. Uh, you know, we, we had to create servers to, to be able to hold the, the different content because the app store restrictions uh, on size for, for apps. Uh, I'll kind of go through these different ones so you can kind of see again. Um, and so as the user experiences this, something that I think is personally profound um, that I've heard from, oh, and I should stop, I, I, I'll say this is in my, in particular, this is my favorite location, also because of how well it blends. You can see the historic cars, but the um, modern cars, uh, in real life cars um, passing by, and it kind of has this seamless experience. But for me and, and so many members of the community, one of the great pieces of feedback we got was that people walking in these areas of Uptown Charlotte now associate them um, with Brooklyn. So if you're in Charlotte um, and you've seen this building, this is the NASCAR Hall of Fame. Uh, but at one point, it was the first uh, Black library in the public uh, library for um, African-American community in Charlotte. So um, it's, it's one of those things where I, I live not too far away from all this. And I walked this route, I think I counted somewhere between 30 and 40 times during the course of those three months uh, to make sure these photo fits were as accurate as possible and to just um, you know do justice to the experience. And for, from here on out forever for me, I associate it now with the story of Brooklyn and, and the residents. And uh, we hope this app does uh, justice to their story. Uh, this is Second Ward High School. The Savoy Theater, as you heard um, discussed in the video. And the uh, United House of Prayer. Um, so we have seven of these sites. Uh, each of these sites is marked with signage. Uh, this is was an early um, early version of the the sign that we could carry around. So you can see uh, this is the for the Brevard Street Library. And the QR codes that you see there are for um, if you just come across this as you're walking around town, you can scan it and it'll automatically recognize your phone's operating system. So it'll send you if you're on Android to the Play Store and iOS to the App Store. Um, so I had some fun in this in this project walking around. I should say I lost quite a few pounds walking this entire route, making sure everything was as perfect as possible. Um, not, not what you'd expect from app development, right? Um, to, to, to get some weight loss in, in the process. But the real heroes here, as far as the, the signage and the footprints are the Charlotte Department of Transportation. So the museum and uh, Potions and Pixels, we, we worked with the Department of Transportation to install these. Uh, as you can see before, if you can see these, these are actually just spray painted lines. Um, I just, before this, in order to, you know, test out the app and during the course of development, I just walked around town and spray painted. Um, I had plenty of police circling me, <laughs> believe it or not. Charlotte's famous for having a very clean um, center city and plenty of police circled me. But when you look confident and you're just spray painting and <laughs> just doing your thing, um, they, they didn't end up... Um, bothering me but you can see that the department of transportation also put in brand new pavement for this so um as somebody who's also a city planning geek as you know from earlier in the presentation i i have a lot of love for um them and uh, appreciation for for them donating this uh, to the experience and so this is them placing down the footprints this is putting up the signage a lot of cool tech involved in, in this process here that i appreciated and so users see this and it's um, a welcoming experience for people to um, learn about history, even if you're just passing by and you just read uh, the, um, the signage. It's amazing. This gentleman here, um, this was uh, quite an emotional experience for him because his mother grew up in the neighborhood. And so he told us about how, um, um, how, how she didn't actually really want to talk about it growing up and when they asked her questions about it because of uh, how how much she was affected by um, the displacement of the neighborhood and, and neighbors being separated from one another and spread across 
town into environments that were also not walkable. And we'll, we'll talk about that in one of our other projects. Um, but it was kind of a, a full circle experience for him um, considering his family's connection there. So yeah, again, big shout out to the Shaw Department of Transportation. Just wanted to give you guys a, a quick view of, of what it looked like for us when we were configuring some of these images. So we were doing these all by hand. So you can see we're kind of having all these sliders that we can manipulate. Again, huge credit to the, the team we have. Um, I got I got so much love for our team. I, I cannot take credit for all this amazing technical technical stuff. It's it's folks on our team that are just whizzes and, and civic minded geeks that I have so much love and appreciation for. Uh, but you can see here, uh, Eric, um, the the project director on the museum side, um, it was an amazing person to work with and, and was the main person involved in, in bringing this um, exhibit from the museum to life. Um, uh, he's the one who reached out to us about developing the app. Um, we worked together on this and, you know, this is him standing here so I can get the proportions right, move things around. But I wanted you guys to see kind of what that looked like, that we can kind of manipulate these things in real time. Also wanted to share this funny story. I know I'm running lower on time, um, so I'll be kind of quicker about these. But um, in some of these cases, we actually found that um, the city actually didn't own certain parts of um, the sidewalk uptown. So in this case, there's a private developer that owned this sidewalk, and we just had trouble getting a hold of them in order to ask if we can install the footprints. So the city actually poured the slab of concrete here and installed. But as you can see here, if you notice, it's uh, all wet because the private um, company there had these sprinklers set up. And so these were installed about, I think, a week or so before the app went live. So we were really down to the wire configuring these. Um, and so prior, I, I had configured all these footprints, but I wanted to make sure I'm, I'm definitely very meticulous, maybe overly so, but I wanted to make sure these were um, perfectly on point. And so as you can see here, I sat in the water <laughs> getting sprayed by the sprinklers uh, for 15 minutes straight in order to make sure the image was lined up as perfectly as possible. Uh, a lot of people, there was a lot of stairs, a lot of People wondering what the hell I was doing, standing, <laughs> getting soaked by a sprinkler. But um, this is the potions and pixels dedication here, folks. This is this is what we do, and we wanted to make sure uh, when it went live that it was as perfect as possible. Uh, so again, I want to just um, show some of these pictures of uh, the app itself to provide a bit more context. So as the user walks around, they automatically trigger all of these sites. And so there's a particle effects that um, uh, like, you know, little sparkles that come about when you're near the sites. You can listen to audio while you're walking. You can explore the different content. Again, the museum has the opportunity uh, right now with the software we developed for them that if they wanna drop a node anywhere, they can drop a node here, add whatever content they want. They can do that um, on the fly. And we're really proud of that. Um, we're also really proud of the achievement system that we developed. And I'll jump on over to that. Um, so the achievement system rewards users for interacting with the app in a variety of different ways. And so what we wanted to do um, is have this kind of gamification portion of the app, but do it in an obviously very respectful way. Uh, this is historically kind of sacred ground. And so we wanna make sure uh, we do it in a respectful manner. And so you can see here that users um, can earn achievements by visiting augmented reality sites, by leaving comments, by listening to the whole uh, Brooklyn story, which is the narration, a whole host of things. And as part of that, for every achievement they get, they actually earn a reward. And so when we were developing this, I wanted to do something where rewards were part of the process, but not to do it in a commercial way, again, that felt antithetical to the, the sacred historical nature and, and, the, and the stories of the site. And so um, I uh, suggested to the museum that we team up with all local black owned businesses for, um, um, for the rewards. Uh, and so in, in it's a kind of a win-win of sorts so that the users themselves by interacting with the app, um, they get rewards to local businesses and then the businesses themselves 
get uh, promotion within the app. And it's completely a free of charge to them. Um, and it's we're, we're grateful to them to, to participate in this. So we have we actually have more than 12 businesses that participate. But if you experience this app, you'll see that it kind of has a sort of Groupon system where uh, you earn this reward, you just show it to the, the place of business, and you get that specific reward there. Um, so we're really appreciative of that. The businesses involved were also um, super appreciative about being involved and being able to, to, to help incentivize people to learn more about this story. And, it, and it's been great for them to um, have a, you know, additional customers as well. Um, so that's something I'd, I'd love to elaborate on in, in the question and answer portion as well. Uh, we got a lot of press um, for this that we're really proud of. And um, I, I, this project has been great. And I think in um, hearing also from the, the members of uh, former members who lived in Brooklyn, uh, you saw one of the individuals in the video was actually at the launch event. And it was great hearing from him about how much this, this honors the experience. Uh, the last project I'm going to talk about here is, I'm going to fly through this really quickly. Uh, this is another aug uh, augmented reality project that we're working on, and it's around the Urban Arboretum Trail. Now, you don't need to know the specifics about this trail, but I should say that this trail is specifically meant to link neighborhoods that were separated by the construction of um, two major highways in Charlotte, I-77 and I-277. These are all historically black neighborhoods. This is a historically black college, Johnson C. Smith University. And, and at one point you were able to walk between all of these neighborhoods in this historic cemetery here, uh, but that um, was um, that's not possible with, with the highway development. And so we wanted to create an app uh, the city um, wanted to create an experience and we proposed an app to them uh, that would encourage people to learn about the history and learn about art and um, learn about environmental, um, um, uh, learn about the environment around them as part of the trail. And so as part of this, we actually took a step back and said, hey, before we develop an app, could we actually, we, we want to hear directly from the community um, and Again, this is probably the community organizer side in me and, and the amazing people at the city and another um, consultant, Gokata, um, uh, Jenny with Gokata, I'm super proud to have worked with them on this, that we're all on the same page and saying, hey, we want to hear directly from residents. And so we created a youth program directly recruiting residents from the north end here and the west end. Um, and so as I kind of go over this uh, last thing before we jump to questions, I'll just share some pictures from the camp that we hosted. So we hosted a full week, full day camp. Um, where we taught the students about um, augmented reality, virtual reality, extended reality, mixed reality, everything in, in that realm. And you can see that they um, interacted with a variety of different historical exhibits with professors in the area that have done augmented reality work. But as part of this, the whole goal uh, of this week-long process was to actually have the students create prototype apps. Uh, and so they actually created uh, prototype apps at the end of the week. And I'm really proud to say that um, we're actually taking those uh, prototypes and developing a full-fledged app out of them. And the full-fledged app will actually be an experience around the um, around the section of the Urban Arboretum Trail. We're going to start with the cemetery there. It's a very large cemetery, um, uh, the Pinewood um, and Elmwood Cemetery. And I say both names because it was actually a segregated um, cemetery. Let me move to the next day. Uh, a segregated cemetery, and you'll see actually the students will be visiting the cemetery in this in this video right here. Uh, this section right here, as we were talking about art augmented reality through Mario Kart Live. And so I really wanted to make sure that the students were able to interact as tangibly as possible with um, with augmented reality. And so to be able to design uh, race tracks and race and augmented reality was a special experience. So this cemetery that you see is the Pinewood and Elmwood Cemetery. You might have noticed it was very quick, but there was a section of the cemetery that looked like it was empty, um, that looked like it didn't have any headstones. Uh, well, actually, that was the area of the cemetery where um, many Black members of the community were buried and unfortunately were um, uh, th through denied the opportunity to have a headstone. Um, and uh, because of that, um, a lot of the students that resonated with so many of the students where they wanted to honor the stories of the people in the cemetery. And so the app is um, focused on telling the story about how the 
the cemetery was at one point segregated, how it became desegregated. And the augmented reality component not only will show the historic photos of the tearing down the fence between the cemeteries, but the other piece is it's actually going to show digital um, augmented reality headstones. And so um, I should say again that this was this idea was completely from the students themselves. It, it kind of blew us all away when they said that. We were like, that's amazing um, to be able to tell their story through audio and, and video and to have the digital um, headstones. And so I mentioned this project because this is when I was mentioning earlier, the youth work that we do and we'll be doing more in the future, this is the exact type of work that we're going to be expanding on. The idea that um, you don't actually just make these experiences or apps or games completely on their own. You don't do that in a silo. You actually work with members of the community. So for us, it's kind of a trifecta, a triforce of sorts, where you take um, the developers, um, and you know us, us the, the people who have the, the tech and the expertise and engagement, you pair us with issue experts, in this case, the city and other local affected community members. And then finally, you pair that with impacted members of the community that directly know uh, what's going on in their community and, um, and have a say and, and, and a voice in um, what these projects will look like. And once you have all three together, I think you can really make an, an effective um, app or game or any sort of experience you want. And so I'll show the last day here where the students graduated and then that will be the last, the last thing I'll show. This is where the students were working with mentors. Um, these mentors are, are friends of mine. We also, I, I really wanted to ensure that the students um, were linked because 95% of the students involved were people of color. We wanted to make sure that the, the mentors reflected that as well and that they could see uh, people in, in tech positions and um, in, in positions that they could aspire to. So you can see the students right here who are presenting their, um, their, um, their app prototypes and, and graduating. And we had a fun virtual reality uh, celebration at the end of this. So I know I've gone way over time. It's funny how I thought I would struggle to talk for 45 minutes and um, I've definitely gone before that. So I'll leave this future plans uh, to pay maybe question answers, but I'll also leave this in case we don't have enough time for you all to, to reach out to me directly. But thank you all so much. This has been an absolutely amazing experience. I hope you all enjoyed it. Thank you so much, Michael. That was an incredible presentation. And it's just so interesting to see how you've taken all this knowledge as a player and, and brought that to these impactful experiences. Um, Thank you. So I'm, there are a lot of questions. Um, as I said, the panel, we have a group of panelists. Um, so I'll take a couple of questions there and then we'll go straight to the audience and get some of their questions. So William. Yeah, Michael, thank you very much. Um, I'm really impressed by <clears throat> your ability to, uh, to find community partners, to engage with the education system. Um, that's terrific. And my question is a question of scalability. Um, obviously, in a, in a community setting like the one you have, where you have deep knowledge, political connections, you really, you know the people to talk to to find out what the issues are, this really works well. And with AR, um, okay, you have an app and that, that obviously can, can be rescanned and, and extended elsewhere. But with the game, there's a tremendous amount of labor in, in building games. We make them here as well. And my question is, do, do you have thoughts about scalability? Can you go, are there ways to empower folks in other communities? Or how do you, how do you see going beyond um, the strength of your project, which is its locality, into something broader and bigger? Yeah, Thanks. I mean, that's, that's an excellent question because that's the issue we're dealing with directly. Honestly, that's the issue I, I th think about, I was thinking about right before this talk, honestly, when I'm thinking about you know, how we're managing um, and growing uh, this nonprofit and keeping it sustainable. Uh, honestly, yeah, I think there are actually more, um, more opportunities than we can keep up with. And so to address that specific piece, as much as I wanna keep developing games and we're currently developing several games and apps right now, um, but what we really wanna do is really uh, dig deep into that final component I mentioned where we pair um, you know, game developers with impacted members of the community and issue, issue experts and kind of do game design challenges, game jams, where people are actually developing games or apps or anything, even like th theater it, or, or just tech experience. We have projected art and mural stuff that we're, we're looking 
into right now as well. And so empowering members of the community to actually create those experiences directly. So it doesn't actually always just come directly from us. Um, and in that way, we're also hopefully, hopefully developing relationships between people who are um, part of that trifecta in order to work more in their community, develop the game industry, all sorts of things that we're working on. Um, but um, yeah, scalability is something that's on our on our heads. And I don't have quite the full answer to it, but that's the next step in our plans is to keep developing games on our on our end, but actually empower people more uh, to develop games um, and expand from there. All right, so it looks like I'll, um, we'll, we have a bunch of questions from the attendees. I'll start with Andrew Martin Sugars, who asks and says, picking up on the electrical skills project, how did you come across the need? Did you see it in the paper or were you approached to get involved? Yeah, it's interesting. All these kind of experiences are just kind of relationships over time and you kind of, um, uh, it, it's honestly, it's it's wild. I pinch myself that I'm even doing this full time, if I'm being honest, that this is this dream is alive, because a lot of these ideas, it, when I first thought of them, and I was kind of a little scared to even say them out loud, because I wondered, are people going to take this seriously? If I say I'm going to do a, a an arcade electrical design workforce development program, I thought, you know, there'd be some people who would laugh me out the door. Um, but honestly, it just came from um, people who were interested in our work, who we connected with and said, hey, is there an opportunity for collaboration? The community organizing mindset that I have is always like, is there an opportunity for collaboration at every step of the way? And so it came from people that we knew, we heard that there was a need in that area. We knew people who were experts in being able to train this, connected the dots and uh, a lot of work went involved. So it's uh, definitely easier said than done, especially to run a whole three month program. Um, but it, that, that's how it, how it came together. It's just through relationships and, and um, learning what the needs were in our community directly. All right. We have a question, an anonymous attendee. Um, did you also make the film for Brooklyn? Was the film included in the app? And she loves it from Sandra Creighton. Oh, thanks. <laughs> yeah, no, the film wasn't from us. That's actually from our local newspaper, uh, the Charlotte Observer. Uh, but there is video, audio and um, poetry and, and a variety of other media that you can experience in that directly. And it's going to continue to be updated. So just know it's kind of a, a living app that will have more stories soon. Okay, and a question from Emiliano Gonzalez Marasa. <clears throat> Is no CLT an app um, open for other developments? Um, other developments in term, um, so I, I guess other I uses, perhaps, or other uh, yeah. So I guess programmers I to develop. Both. So, it, so in terms of whether it's going to be expanded, we're going to be adding all sorts of different stories to it over time, and so it's going to be a living app that's going to have more content. As far as whether um, others, we're, we're definitely hoping to work with others. I will say, it, yeah, it is our kind of tech, but. Honestly, we're a 501c3 nonprofit, and our whole point in this is to work with other nonprofits to make this easy. If I'm being honest, um, a lot of the projects that we do, when we find out folks in the private sector, I love folks in the private sector, but when we find out like how much they're charging for the exact same work that we do, it's such an astronomical difference, just an astronomical difference in cost. And so um, if there's any community that's interested in doing it, we walk them hand in hand and say, hey, these are the things that you should be interested in. If we're not the partner for you, we can help you find somebody else. But the whole point is to be another nonprofit that you can actually look to and talk to, because a lot of this stuff honestly feels like magic. And so if an app is $10,000, $200,000, a million dollars, a lot of times people will have no idea um, uh, at what point to compare it to. And so we like to be able to work with others to be able to clear that up. All right, we have some panelist questions. Um, why don't we take Kat and then William? Hi there. Uh, thanks for this great presentation, Michael. Thank I'm you. curious. Um, with, uh, from a community development perspective, um, you know, there's so much power to be had in bringing the, this history, this erased history to life in an augmented fashion. Yeah. But at the end of the day, you turn off the phone and those images are gone. And I'm curious, um, maybe you're too early in the process, but as, as the community builds this knowledge and visualizes it, what is the impact on the physical space? Are there, are there new kinds of que real questions about what should be done in the physical world? 
um, it, looking into the future. For sure. Actually, um, th that's actually one of the next apps that we're working on was, is with some folks from our local school of architecture as well, um, specifically about that. Uh, you could probably tell from my work in, uh, in local built environment sustainability work and, and the work with the planning department that I'm, uh, I'm a, a freak for all these sorts of things. So um, I totally hear you loud and clear about that. I think part of that is helping people realize the type of development that we want to see. Um, the development in Brooklyn was um, the kind of traditional, more walkable, mixed-use development that we, as a, uh, that I personally would hope to see more of. Uh, and so a lot of these projects highlight the fact that with this disruption, we not only separated people, but we built environments where uh, that are not walkable, that are not healthy because they're not walkable, um, that are not uh, uh, public transportation or bike friendly. Um, and so that's something we're very involved in. And in fact, another project that we're involved in to give you another sneak peek um, that we'll be launching uh, next year is something where we're going to be having a panel, um, a live panel with city planners and using the game City Skylines, if people are familiar with that. It's like SimCity and having regular community um, meetings about the type of um, the type of development we want to see in our community. So, so stay tuned. There's, there's much more on, on that front, but I agree that it needs to translate into actual long-term change rather than just um, be an app, a, a fun historical experience. It's got to be more than that. Okay, uh, William. Sure. Uh, so I'm really interested in, as you conceptualize these basically these transmedia spreads. You're working in print, you're working in games, uh, you know, you're working across a, a bunch of different uh, media forms. How do you work the balance between um, the expressivity of the medium and the audience you're trying to reach? In other words, games are really good for simulation. And if you wanna talk about policy choices, games are a really better medium than print because you can really get people yeah. to kind of comprehend that. On the other hand, games speak to a particular subset of the public, uh, not necessarily um, the grandmothers in the crowd, I mean, to be to be or grandfathers in the crowd for that matter. Um, so how do you how do you work that balance between who you're trying to reach using media that will reach specific groups on the one hand, and using media that can articulate and communicate problems in a very in a very, you know, distinctive way on the other? Yeah. Um, yeah, there definitely is, I think, a, a generational divide in terms of how people see games. Um, I'm, I'm glad to see that we've kind of reached a point where, um, especially my, my generation, and especially, I guess, um, the, the, the newest generations, is that they no longer, uh, like, I would never ask any of you guys, do you listen to music, right? It's, I, I would ask you, what kind of music do you listen to? Everybody listens to music. And games have become that now for the newest generations, where we no longer really ask, do you play games? It's what games do you play? And so uh, there still is that divide, of course. And so I definitely wouldn't say from an engagement standpoint that you should take a strict game approach as much as I, I love games. I don't think it's the, the only way, just as, you know, when you're reaching communities, you shouldn't do digital only, you know, knock on doors, do traditional flyers for a variety of different reasons. Uh, but in this case, I think the benefits of, of gaming um, are that you're actually reaching a kind of more youthful demographic and getting them in part, uh, getting them to participate and be more civically engaged is massive. And, um, and that is incredibly important. So I think the game piece should be a component of, of community engagement across the board for cities on different projects. Again, it shouldn't be the only, and the type of engagement it is, whether it's a board game, whether it's a video game, whether it's a, a single person experience versus a multiplayer experience, the, those considerations kind of have to go um, based on the, the, the specific needs. But um, I totally feel what you're saying. So I guess my point is, games, we need to expand, massively expand their, their usage in this way, but they shouldn't be the end all and be all in these projects. Yeah, and along those lines, a question from um, Shell Evergreen. Do you have any stats on how many people are actually using this app on location, the AR app? Yeah, actually, we went hardcore with, with stats. So we can we can track everything, actually, on there. We, we have a, a robust privacy policy, I should say. So we're not able to... Um, you're not linked to any specific person. We can't do that, but we can see, you know, that a user went to this site and clicked on this, listened to this audio, and did this augmented reality experience. Um, so I haven't looked at the latest stuff. Actually, the the I'll, I'll have to look soon. Uh, but it blew the museum's expectations. So um, 
I don't know how much I can actually say based on their expectations, but I can say it was about four times more users than they had set their goals for, which I think is significantly high, especially uh, for their first foray into the digital experience. Um, I should say one of the, the stats that we are also surprised a bit about was how many people are using the app remotely. It was built, you know, with the idea that people would be coming there physically. And we, we knew that if we had the remote option, that a lot of people would use that. And it's easier to do remote than driving or walking or taking a public transportation to get uptown. Um, but a lot of people are using it remotely. So something we're considering in the future is maybe having augmented reality experiences that people can experience from home. But I will say, going there physically on the streets, seeing it, there's nothing like it. Uh, and it's historically significant in that way to hear the stories of the people who live there on the streets where the history actually happened. Okay, so there's a question here from Bao Choi. Uh, he says, um, hi, I'm Bao Choi, a Neiman fellow and a journalist from Hong Kong. Obviously, I, I knew nothing about game design. Can you introduce how do you start with a specific project, such as how do you design the medium, the interface, and what are the game elements? So a big question, um, maybe you can distill it with a few key points and point them to some other resources or such. Yeah, I, I would say um, a big part of it is, you. I think you have to really have a passion for game design. I think um, just like any creative endeavor, I think it's, it's sometimes too easy to just assume, like when you see a, a painting, you think, oh, that's just paint put on a, a surface. Anybody can do that. Game design is difficult. The amount of sleepless nights I had designing <laughs> That that board game, I can tell you, uh, yeah, wasn't always romantic or, or uh, the you know a sexy experience that people kind of think it is to just design and it's super fun and cool. Uh, it's it's a lot of hard work, so I think you really do need to have um, uh, a, a a background or an appreciation. I don't have a formal training in game design, but I do have a, a lifelong appreciation for it. So I would say start with that and make sure to start with the the kind of the fun the game factor. I think all too often the biggest mistake people do is just attach the name game to something that's not actually fun. It's not actually having interesting choices. It's something that the a user will see through immediately. And if it's and if they don't enjoy it, or maybe not enjoy is the right word, but if they don't appreciate the experience, um, then they're not going to um, they're not going to continue using it. So it's got to be designed uh, with with um, proper interactive design elements. Okay, so we have a question here from Gabriel Vieira Posada. Uh, he says, congrats, Michael, very inspiring and powerful work. Um, I love your participation approach. How could other cities and countries adapt and use your apps for new territories, populations, and stories? Thanks so much for the compliment. Yeah, I'd love to see more organizations like ours right around the world uh, to be able to to tell these community stories. I mean, I, I used to I used to teach African American history. Um, I'm in a inter interracial um, marriage of 20 years, and and I think you know you have a sense that you feel like you understand this type of history that's going on in our community. But even then, I didn't know um, the full extent of it. Uh, and so I think there's so many stories that every community, there's a Brooklyn in every single American, major American city. And so those stories need to be told. Um, I, uh, I think it, it, it's hard for me to say because it was such a hard process getting this operation up and running. I wish we could franchise it and spread it around. We're still figuring things out and, you know, um, expanding. But um, I, I think if, if you're really passionate about this, then um, first off, talk to me. Let's schedule a meeting together. There's my email. I'd be more than happy to talk you through kind of the, the things I learned, the good and the bad and the ugly through the process. And we can maybe figure out how you can kind of um, take this into your community and, and work with others. Great. So we have a question from Jeff Soik. Uh, he says, thanks for sharing, Michael. I'm actually advising on a project in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, oh, awesome. based, around, um, based around a community garden and the community's rich African-American history. One thing we're trying to be mindful of is how the community can engage in the storytelling process and really have the opportunity to own their story and how it should be told while making sure that those of us who are makers with all the tech access, film editing experience, web dev, web dev skills um, can help facilitate that story ownership 
without overshadowing it. Did you run into this with the Brooklyn project? The last example you shared did seem to touch on this issue, but I'm very curious to hear more. Yeah, no, I, I love that. And yeah, I went to Wake Forest and Winston-Salem. My cousin went to Winston-Salem State. So I um, shout out to Winston-Salem here. Um, uh, yeah, I, I would say the approach, the approach for Brooklyn and the approach for um, uh, the augmented reality uh, camp that we hosted with the students was slightly different, partly because we hosted the camp for the students. And so having us hosting that with the city and the city um, and, and Gokata, the consultant group entrusting us, allowed us to be much more focused on um, working directly with members of the community. Uh, the museum was a different approach because the museum reached out to us to hire us to develop the app. So they had more of the relations with the members of the community and they had already created an exhibit in the museum. So a lot of those stories had been recorded and, um, and, and created ahead of time. Um, so I, I would say uh, uh, that the approach that we took with the students is the approach that I wanna take long-term uh, where again, that you kind of have that trifecta of sorts and similar to what you are doing, pairing developers with impacted members of the community. And it sounds like the issue experts as well. So it sounds like you're doing the exact um, right thing in that regard. It is, it can definitely be challenging. You definitely want to build trust um, with the communities you're working with um, and have open and honest communication because everybody's com coming from different stand uh, points. It's, it's hard for me to get into the nitty gritty without knowing all the specifics. So again, I'd love for you to reach out and maybe we can talk to the specifics there, but uh, it sounds like your approach and, and the project, it, it sounds unbelievable. I'd love to, to learn more. All right, it looks like we're out of time. Um, so thank you, Michael, for you know your work and, and presentation and your thank clearly- you deep engagement with your city. And thank you to all the panelists and the attendees for being here today. Um, next week, we have Rasheen Hadaj and uh, Jeffrey Smith with us talking about their co-creation project. And until then, have a good day. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. I really appreciate it.